degenerative diseases of the brain that cause dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Hello, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Tonight we're going to talk about neurodegenerative disorders. Familial examples would be Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of dementias, Parkinson's disease, uh, progressive multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, like Lou Gehrig's disease, Huntington's disease, those kinds of things. Joining us on the discussion of these brain and nervous system disorders is Dr. Jennifer Kruger. She's a neurologist at the Regional Medical Clinic Neurology and Rehabilitation in Rapid City. We also have Dr. Matthew Simmons, who is the Associate Dean of the USD Sanford School of Medicine and head of the Rapid City campus for the medical school. He's also a neurologist as well as an administrator. Thank you both for, for being here. Thank you. So Jennifer, tell us a little bit about what drew you into the world of neurology. Well, that's, that's always the million dollar question, right? You're right. Um, so what, you know, when I was in medical school, I was really torn. I liked lots of things. Um, Your I, father's a rheumatologist. Right, yeah, he tried to get me to go that route. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had a lot of interest in a lot of things, um, but it became clear over time that I really enjoyed a clinical exam and being able to piece together a puzzle based on an exam. Um, and I realized that neurology was a great fit for that. It was something where I could see a patient, I could do a physical exam, and I could determine where in the central nervous system the problem was to some degree based on the exam, and I liked that. Um, and that's probably also what led to eventually doing a movement disorder fellowship because that really focused on a clinical exam. Right, your fellowship. Tell us a little bit about movement disorder fellowship. Sure. So um, it was extra training on top of the regular neurology residency. Right. Um, and really involved seeing a lot of Parkinson's patients, essential tremor patients, um, patients with dystonias of all sorts. Dystonia meaning a movement abnormal. Right, yep. Um, as well as, you know, Huntington's disease and, and various other more rare movement disorders as well. So that's your, your strength, your concentrated interest, yep. but you do all general neurology Correct. probably as well. Yep, yep. So that's the majority of my patient base, but um, I also see a lot of um, general neurology as well. I think a lot of the neurology field developed because of that very same thing you said earlier, trying to define exactly where in the brain was the disorder, even w because we didn't have CAT scans. Right. And we didn't know what was going on in the brain. Normal x-rays wouldn't show what was happening. You had to have that exam to tell us. Right. So Matt, you're, you're um, probably doing a fair amount of administrative work, not just neurology. Yeah, it's about half and half now. So I um, still stay mm -hmm. active in the clinical world of general neurology. Mm -hmm. You're from where originally? I'm from Minnesota originally. And what drew you to neurology yourself? Um, I would, I don't know if it was like Jen, but I, I um, became interested at the basic science level, actually. And I think a lot of neurologists actually do find the neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, and that sort of thing early on in their training that they receive at the basic science level. Before they even get to the clinical world, they kind of have that preliminary interest. And um, I think that that um, really certainly caught my attention. And I just found it the most interesting specialty. It's just a very dynamic, it, it includes such a wide variety of different conditions and you get to use all of your skills in very diverse ways yeah. because you have to deal with such a variety of different things. So um, I just found all those things appealing. Um, so, and you know, as a generalist, I love being able to listen carefully to that history and then do that thorough examination and come up with a diagnosis that I think is the answer and then confirm it one way or another if the tests are ne needed. I think Jen, Jen alluded to that, that in today's world, even though we have lots of diagnostic tools, um, the neurologist still depends heavily on the bedside exam and the history that they take at the bedside, more so than most specialties, I, I believe. I mean, I, I think you can hear different opinions. Rheumatology still, I think, is pretty important as a bedside right, the skill. Right, sure. um, But many of the other... Um, um, specialists or practitioners, I think, have gravitated toward using uh, diagnostic studies, which are very good to use, but 
Um, it just so happens that the nervous system is such that um, some things you can't take pictures of. No. <laughs> I think Jen would, for example, she would probably point out that when you diagnose Parkinson's disease, you don't do a scan. I mean, you don't don't need a scan as it's, as it is right now. I mean, there may come a time when we you know we t as we talk about the future that things will change, and we probably will use you know more advanced diagnostic studies. Um, but at the present time, a lot of things. It's kind of nice about it. her specialty. She actually can almost diagnose people by video. Yeah. I mean, she can look at it's a video very interesting, tape. Interesting though, <laughs> yeah. because I think the shift is in all areas of medicine. You go see the doctor, and then you end up with. The CAT tests, scan or the MRI. Right, the... and so I always, when I diagnose new Parkinson's patients, it's always, well, aren't you going to do a test? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as well, there isn't there a test. Isn't. I, yeah. you know, and I spend a lot of time going over how we make the diagnosis, and, and we'll probably talk about that later. My favorite rheumatologist, your father, would make that point about rheumatoid arthritis or a variety of different uh, you know, arthritic conditions. You don't have a test. You, right. It's a clinical diagnosis. Yeah. So, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, even when we're consulting in the hospital, I don't know how often we get that call that so-and-so has a stroke on their MRI, and then we go to see them, and it turns out that's probably not the real issue, and it's not even it related to what's going on. So, even though you have imaging sometimes, it sometimes takes you in the wrong direction. Well, it back has pain. nothing to do with the problem. Back pain and an MRI, I mean, MRI doesn't tell you that, that, that the, the back pain is the, the real problem. I right. mean, it'll show you... And anybody will show terrible changes, whether it's because of something that is shown on an MRI is another story. There's sort of a subculture humor about the bedside skills of the neurologist, though. Um, and one of our, one of the persons who, one of the neurologists who has written about clinical skills in neurology mm -hmm. said, well, there's really only two reasons to consult the neurologist anymore, and that's if the MRI is abnormal and when the MRI is normal. Yeah. So you still, so you still <laughs> need, well, because you still need that bedside um, ability to sort out based mm -hmm. on the history and the exam. And so that just, it's sort of a humorous way of looking at um, how we apply our skills. Mm -hmm. And still, um, we, we are very much uh, devoted to understanding the patient's story and then their bedside exam. That's, so. that's perfect, I love that. Uh, let's talk about uh, neurodegenerative diseases. I mean, what is, a neurodegenerative disease by definition? Well, um, I wouldn't necessarily quote an exact formal defi definition, but I would say that there are certain features that we would all recognize as part of a neurodegenerative disorder. That is uh, a nervous system that starts out functioning normally, but then it somehow degenerates or loses function, um, usually in a gradual way, the way we think of that. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why that might happen. Um, some are very specific genetic abnormalities, like Huntington's disease, I think would be a good example where I don't, do they even speculate about any sort of environmental component or it's really no, heavily, it's just all genetic. How genetic, yeah. genetic yeah. Okay, so um, now we could contrast that with, say, Parkinson's disease or maybe Alzheimer's disease where, yeah, we understand that there's some genetic pieces to it, but there certainly is um, emphasis on the environment. And multiple sclerosis would be another one where people are, have been looking forever and ever and ever, where's the, where's the cause? You know, right. Is it because you know, people are just naturally susceptible? Do they then experience a virus infection or something that triggers um, the actual disease? Um, so we, I, I think in our world, we, when we think about neurodegenerative disorders, we, when we think about causes, we, we hover between how much is genetic, how much is environmental, is it a combination of those factors working together? And I, what's, what's your take on that? I mean, like with yeah, Parkinson's would be a good example, right? I mean, right. yeah, you know, and we don't know exactly what causes Parkinson's, and I think that's the case with a lot of neurology. And even going back to the an original question about why we chose our field. Part of the, the thing about it is that it's ever evolving and it's changing and you have to learn and um, we're learning new information all the time and that makes it exciting. Right. Um, so, you know, we don't know all the answers. In Parkinson's, we think there's probably a genetic component, but even if you carry the gene, 
one of the genes that's been identified doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. So, right. you know, it's probably a combination of environmental factors, pesticides or other, um, along with a genetic tendency. I've heard that. Pesticides has been blamed for a lot of the causes. I mean, something, some toxin in our environment sometime during our life, maybe a viral infection, sure. maybe. We don't know, though, for, for much of this. Yeah. The, the big one is Alzheimer's disease. I mean, and of course, that's the fear we all have. I mean, we don't want to end up having lost our memory. Uh, but it does happen. Uh, and if you live long enough, they say, eventually, your, your memory is going to deteriorate some, but not always. L let's talk about it. All, what is, by definition, dementia, Jen? So dementia is just kind of a broad term that, that really describes any sort of cognitive dysfunction. So thinking. Thinking, your brain not working correctly. Um, so it's a pretty broad term, really. Um, One of the key features, though, is that it, it has to be dysfunctional to a level where it's interfering with some sort of activity, like it, whether it's function. Your, your work, yeah, function, like work or, or your home activities. It has to be, in a, in a sense, bad enough to interfere with those things. Um, and, and I realize there's a spectrum. So a common term used today, too, is mild cognitive impairment, where People have lost a little ground, but it's not interfering with their normal functioning, so they still manage and they cope with it. But once it tips over to the point where they can no longer um, handle their normal activities, then, um, then it would be uh, in the world of dementia. And I agree, it's a general term. Um, one person explained it kind of nicely. It's like, it's like a book, and then there's a chapter of Alzheimer's, there's a chapter of advanced Parkinson's disease, there is an, a, a chapter of Huntington, you know, there's a chapter of people that have had strokes, multiple strokes, for example, or traumatic brain injury or some other, you know, uh, maybe it was a drug-induced or alcohol-induced or some, some other. Uh, the point being that there are quite a variety of different types Many of... Many causes yeah, for, exactly. all for dementia. Yeah, exactly. For dementia. You're right. So dementia, general term, think of it as there's all of these little subcategories mm -hmm. and and so that's often what happens when you, we get consulted, right? I mean, you get a referral and they, it's picked up uh, either by family the or the primary care doctor that, okay, they've lost ground and we need to investigate. I, I've heard that really the very best test for, uh, for dementia really is anti-grade memory uh, loss. Jen, would you uh, define how that can be tested? Well, you know, we test in various ways. Um, there are different cognitive tests that are out there. There are, there are small trust tests that we can do in a neurology clinic that don't take long, um, like a mini mental status examination or a clock draw and various things. There's also more extensive neurocognitive testing. Um, our colleagues in, in neuropsychology do a much longer version of the same. Um, you know, more of on term on the lines of three to four hour testing versus yeah. what you can do within a few minutes in your clinic. Um, and so, I don't know what's your experience on what you do in. Sure. Case? Well, obviously, when you talk to the family or even the patient themselves are potentially aware. Oh, I don't remember as well as I used to. And then maybe a family member says, oh yeah, this is what happened. And they kind of tell you, you know. So that's really helpful to get like bystanders and what, yeah. what they've observed. The husband uh, or the wife story sure. sitting in the back in the next room or in the next chair going. Right. <laughs> She's and giving a good cover up there. She doesn't remember as well as she should. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, as far as um, short-term memory loss sort of presenting as the most common symptom of people that have, say, mild cognitive impairment or, you know, Alzheimer's disease, for Learning example. Learning a new thing. Um, now, the, if someone's v severely impaired, you can pick it up right away on the interview. You're going to know right away just talking to them right. that they're it's, not remembering what you just told them, you know. so It's uh, the mild one that, that's harder. Right. Now, and that's where, by the way, the neuropsychologist is very helpful because... Um, how many times do we see people that are worried about their memory, mm -hmm. right? And then they, they end up seeing us and we say, well, you know, I think you're okay, but oh, I'm so worried. And well, okay, let's go to the neuropsychologist. They're gonna do a much more thorough yeah. assessment. And a lot of them come back what I would call the worried well. Yeah. You know, which is good. You like to tell me, I'm sorry, you know, great. It turned out okay. Typically when they come to me and they say, I'm worried that I'm losing my memory, they have no problem with their memory. Uh, yeah. And that's We're interesting. Gonna, go ahead. Yeah. I'm, you know, normally the ones that come in by themselves saying they're worried are the ones that don't end up having a problem. Yeah. The people who have a problem just Cover don't it up. realize it or, yeah. or aren't aware it of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or don't want to have this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
While we have to focus on a patient's side of dementia, what is it like to be a caregiver, caregiver for someone who is diagnosed with this? 13 months after taking care of her full time, then I had a heart attack. And so <laughs> then we had a team meeting with my son and my daughter. And that's when we decided that we had to get her into a home. That was, I think, the hardest part about the caregiver deal is you think you can do it, and, and I know exactly where everybody's coming from because you think you can do it. And her mom thought also the same thing about taking care of her dad. And we said, you cannot do this much longer. You can't do this much longer. We need to get you help and before something would happen to her. And so we did get him into the nursing home also that had an Alzheimer's unit. Kyle put it right in his book here at the end. All the people that have the disease, I mean 250,000 children and adults between the ages of 8 and 18 that provide help to someone with Alzheimer's disease. And Every, six, every 67 seconds, somebody has it. In 13 years, Alzheimer's deaths increased to, by 71%. And Alzheimer's and dementia cost the nation $228 billion. By 2050, they think these costs are going to rise to $1.1 trillion. It takes everything away out, out of your life. It's And I told Peg that when we... When her dad got the disease, I said, you know what, this disease sucks. But it, it's for the survivors. The person that has the disease, there's nothing, nothing hurting them. They have nothing ailing them. There's no muscle hurt. There's no pain. It's not like cancer at all. It's not like recovering from a heart attack. Uh, it's nothing like that at all. There's nothing wrong with them. Except their brain. It was easy to to talk to people at a support meeting because when I tried to take care of my wife I kept telling myself I can't do this anymore I can't do this anymore and when you get to that point you're gonna know it because once we did get her into the nursing home and everybody's seen all the things that I've been doing for her they said you did everything you Because they seen what had, what they, the, the bathing and the clothing thing. They said, "Did you actually do that every day?" And I said, "Yes, I did." And they said, "Wow, you know, the Alzheimer's Association will get you in." And and I've done that with a couple that talked to me, and and I said, "You know what?" They 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 said, "There's no help," and I said, "Yes, there is." And I gave them the Alzheimer's number down here and they were able to come down here and meet they got they got the book they got all the brochures everything and they they thank me for that too so truly the hero in in a, in many households where dementia is occurring is that person who has to care for someone who is gradually losing their memory. Uh, and they're really a hero, aren't they? I mean, you think about the people who really do that. You, have you run, I suppose you run into this all the time, Jen. Uh, yeah, of course, I think we do, and all of us in neurology do. You know, the caregivers are such an important part of the treatment team, really, for the patient and for their whole family. And gosh, I don't know how often my nurse and I have talked about how we're amazed by what caregivers do for their loved ones um, and how much effort it requires and time and really selflessness um, in general. Um, so, you know, a lot of these people um, would be in nursing homes a lot earlier if they didn't have a dedicated caregiver right. to help them at home. Right, absolutely. Although I will say this too, I think uh, sometimes the person who is losing their memory has 
has said, but you will never put me in a nursing home. And really, they're, they're beyond what the caregiver can do. And the caregiver needs to be released of the burden uh, and should say, they're, they're going to be angry, but they don't remember that they'll be angry. And I just can't do it anymore. And that caregiver needs to call that doctor and say, help me, help me, help me. And Anytime. I think that's a good point that when we think about taking care of that patient, we actually have to think about taking care of the caregiver too. I yeah. mean, and, and, and I find myself more and more asking, hey, are you doing okay? Um, you, you know, there's a caregiver burnout that can happen. I think that's really kind of what you're, you're alluding to, that they just are fatigued, um, they're emotionally exhausted, what have you. I mean, that certainly can happen. Thankfully, with resources that are available, I, I like to think that that really doesn't I mean, that we can minimize that, you know, to, to a certain extent, right? Because we bring in other resources. Um, Home health kind sure. of Sure. Mm -hmm. um, there's daycare scenarios. There's respite types mm -hmm. of options. Um, and more and more, I'm finding that there are options available. Uh, and and, and we, we like to support the patient's wishes in the sense that we don't wish them to go into another institution or something outside of their home until they absolutely have to. And so we're, we're very much focused on keeping the patient home, if at all possible, and right. we'll reach into our bag of tricks and, and do it figure as much out as you something. Can. Yeah, we, we, we certainly do that. I would think that our, you know, the problem with home health is that they have to be homebound. When the, right. some of the very best things that that caregiver uh, could do would be to take the person to church, take the person out for dinner, uh, you know, those kinds of things. And, and so, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the right to do that if they're going to be getting home, ca home ca care. Uh, we do have disposition planning nurses at the hospital that have been, have been tremendous help to me. And they've, they teach, they've taught me the resources that are available in our community that can help and uh, there's some things that they can do. And science is on our side a little bit. I think when we realize the medical benefits of socializing, like you say, go to church, go out into the community. You know, the old days of sort of putting somebody away, away from society is really, it's not good for anybody. It's not good for us as a community. It's not good for the patients. They really need to socialize. And, and there's, you know, some science behind that, that socializing yeah. actually helps reduce the severity of their symptoms, you know, as the disease progresses, for example, with the dementia. And so we would really like to have social interaction. We seek that out and we encourage that. So I guess my hope is that at some point um, as, as, as a medical community, we say, look, we're going we're gonna to create socializing opportunities for our patients that they get out more. I think that's important too for the caregivers, uh -huh. just, you know, for that relationship. Think about all those things that you did together as you know, a couple for years and then one can't do it and then you can't go and then you become isolated. And so I think even getting both of them out of the house and maintaining friendships and social activities is important. So th this is a call to the community out there, the people, that are, you know, the church friends, uh, community friends or neighbors. Um, extend past that. Uh, we're all fearful of someone who is who may not be having their mental capacity intact. We need to go out, pull them in, support them, visit them, give them a little time. It doesn't need to take a lot of time, mm -hmm. but just to stay connected. That, that's a wonderful comment, and uh, I, like, I like what you've said. Uh, let's talk about uh, different degenerative disorders, though. Uh, let's talk about Alzheimer's in particular. What do we know about the causes? Well, um, this is still a, mostly a mysterious disorder. Um, there are some specific genetic types. And so when you hear of those sort of rare cases, usually of early onset Alzheimer's, meaning that maybe someone's in their 40s and 50s, um, there's typically a genetic explanation that can be identified in that. Now, thankfully, that's a minority of cases. Right. But for your typical you know, adult, you know, late adult onset, late age onset type of Alzheimer's, um, we do have some genetic clues. We have some genetic markers that are giving us clues about it. Um, but I think it's still rather mysterious as to what actually triggers it. And there's all kinds of debate, controversy going on. You know, is there something, are there, are there's other factors that we don't understand that um, actually trigger the disease. So we've had difficulty matching up 
you know, what's happening in the tissue with what happens in the functional state. And, right. um, but, but we do know some things, and we, and we know enough to, um, I think, um, be able to diagnose it reasonably well. And the future holds um, more promise as well that there will be probably a marker, maybe, you know, we use a the genetic term, thing that we can Yeah, relate. or maybe a, um, a, a, what they call biomarker, like maybe something to do with amyloid or tau protein or, you know, these kinds of things that we bat around in our literature mm -hmm. about, you know, are we going to have a test, for example, are we going to have a blood test or a spinal fluid test or something that's going to give us a specific marker or maybe a specific type of brain scan that's going to say, look, this is Alzheimer's. They're at risk. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and then, and we shouldn't have it uh, until we have this. And that is, then if we have a marker, here's what we can do. Because if we don't have anything we can do, sure. who cares? Yeah. You and, know? That, and that's a you know that's the beauty of it, right? Being able to diagnose sooner and intervene sooner, maybe cure it, right? I mean, that would be our our hope in the future that we. And, and I think that there's a lot of certainly a huge effort with regard to Alzheimer's because yeah. we realize that in our culture, in our society, as an aging population. We are going to have um, many, many cases of Alzheimer's, and so we really want to put a huge effort toward understanding it, treating it the best we can. Now let's talk about treatment. I know that I know of a guy who does puzzles every morning. He does he does all these things, and and actually I've read uh, and I believe it's true that the the most important brain exercise that you can do is a conversation. That's better than any puzzle. And that socializes, and socialization is very important. Jen, what's your take on prevention yeah, of sure. dementia? Um, well, I think there's more and more research about this coming out. You know, I think there's a lot of good information about physical exercise actually being very helpful for brain um, and really across the board, all neurodegenerative disorders. Um, you know, really, rather than focusing on mental exercises so much as really getting out there and doing your physical exercise. Do your 30 minutes of walking every day <laughs> exactly. to keep your brain intact. Right. Wow, I love to hear it, that. It has, it has two, two major factors, as I would say. One is that it plays into this idea of preventing vascular disease. So one of the big things that we seek out with anyone who has a neurodegenerative disorder, whether it's Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or that, is to at the same time make sure that you're preventing stroke, Strokes, right? Yeah. Because yeah. stroke, as people get older, they're at risk for stroke. So the exercise plays into the exercise, the diet, mm -hmm. the um, you know controlling blood pressure, cholesterol, those kinds of things are very important because otherwise you might end up with someone with Alzheimer's and a stroke, right? Yeah. Now you've got a double problem. Um, the other thing that's interesting is I, I had done some reading on this idea of neuroplasticity, the idea that the brain shapes and remodels itself over time. Yeah. That exercise actually um, promotes what's called neurogenesis, the idea that you're actually making, making new neurons wow. and um, or new nerve cells. And some of those cells are kind of like neuro stem cells, like they haven't decided what they're going to be and, <laughs> yeah. and when they grow up, you know. <laughs> but, but they're going to maybe um, create a situation where you're going to diminish the impact of a neurodegenerative disorder. So um, and exercise, well, and you'll talk more about Parkinson's, but I mean, for Parkinson's, it's even especially important because of the mobility issues yeah. that they have. But uh, certainly exercise is a big thing. And, and I think earlier you're kind of talking about healthy aging in a sense, like how do you prevent? So exercise, I think, is a key one. And I kind of alluded to preventing vascular disease. Um, you kind of alluded to this idea of sort of cognitive training. And I don't know, you know, what's your perspective so, uh, on and that? And I'm trying to think they, there's those online programs you can go yeah. on now that you can sign up for that are supposed to be, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head now. But um, I, and I haven't looked at the data recently, but I, had have, I have had some conversations with a colleague of mine who does uh, specialize in dementia. And he really says it's more about continuing the skills and the hobbies that you've always had rather than you know, if, learning a new thing. Yeah, or going on and doing puzzles on a website. Really, you know, do you mm -hmm. like going to play bridge or do you like to, you know, whatever, read books? But really focusing on maintaining your hobbies, mm -hmm. not necessarily forcing yourself to learn something new. Uh, and I agree with you. And some people say even keep working if that's what if you want to do. And yeah, that, I mean, that's it's your what, hobby. Part of it is, you know, what is stimulating? You know, what's stimulating to the brain? It's mm -hmm. kind of 
we, I don't know, do you use that use it or lose it? Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I mean, all the time. Uh, you know, <laughs> and you, and you, kind of, you kind of hear those stories of people, they retired and then they just sort of didn't do anything and they kind of regress. I mean, they yeah. regress uh, socially, cognitively. Mm -hmm. um, th so there's something about stimulating, mentally stimulating activities. The other part of that I think is things that involve learning. Um, you know, th an activity that involves learning, whether you're learning to dance or whether you're learning, they've done studies about, you know, women that quilt and how their brains thicken up with, or l learning a, a, you know, a musical instrument mm -hmm. or a new language or something like that. For the geriatric uh, group, those retired group, apparently, there is an Ollie course that you can take. You can, you can take all these different courses called Ollie and you go to hear a lecture and learn a new thing. Uh, and I sat in on an Ollie lecture on, uh, on a fa famous author uh, and a particular book uh, and just a fascinating story about World War I. And, and so Willa Cather and her World War I story that was a, a, a Pulitzer Prize winner. So I mean, you know, those kinds of things. I think learning, expanding, mm -hmm. opening your brain to new things. But I can't emphasize more what I think you just said, the, the most powerful thing we can do to prevent strokes, prevent vascular disease, isn't going to be a pill, really. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a regular activity, movement, uh, that kind of a thing. Well, let's talk about normal memory loss, because um, as a guy who's getting older, uh, <laughs> memory of, uh, of people's, uh, remembering people's names, for example, uh, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, I've heard that commonly, as we get older, we just know we don't need to hang on to all this um, unimportant stuff and we dump it more automatically. What, what's your take on normal more memory loss, Jen? Well, um, you know, our brain ages just like the rest of us. You know, there's, there's no way around it. So um, along with that, you can expect that with aging, there's going to be some, some dysfunction. Um, you know, I, I don't, you know. It kind, of, it kind of brings back an earlier point, and that is that dementia is not normal part of aging though, right? I mean, right. so in other words, if you lose an, so much ground with your memory that you no longer can function normally, then that's not normal. I mean, that's a disease process, right? So, so it's true that as we age, we're not quite as snappy in certain memory capacities, um, but we actually tend to have some strength in other areas. And if you think about it, how the elders in a community have a certain type of wisdom, a certain way of maybe dealing with life or dealing with yeah. certain things. Uh, you know, they have skills in other areas that they develop too. You know, so there's advantages to getting older, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it's not all a downer, <laughs> yeah. right, as far as, yeah. So, um, but I mean, we can expect some decline in memory uh, as we get older, but it shouldn't um, interfere with your functioning. Uh, and you brought up that, that one, and I, I think that's a, a common and well-proven one now that, you know, just because you can't remember somebody's name doesn't mean you have dementia. I mean, right. um, a lot of us have that, and um, it's, it and it's, it does not correlate well with dementia. Right. Um, the, 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 the studies say it does not right, relate right. to dementia. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. <laughs> Another common disorder is Parkinson's. We hear from a patient who has this condition. Oh, about two years ago, I had trembling in the hand. Thought that was normal. It kept getting worse and worse. My right leg got weaker, hard to walk. Um, went to the therapy. It helped a lot. Standing off a chair, pushing out, uh, that's a good one. And the speech one had me go off for a long time. Encouraged me to read out loud. Main thing is to be active. Sit for 10, 15 minutes and get up. And if I do that, I get up pretty good. But if I sit for three, four hours, I need help getting up usually. Didn't, therapy helped an awful lot. Big, they call it big therapy. Walk big, write big, talk big. And I like to be busy when, when I can. Keep active. So I encourage people to be as active as they can. More movement, the better. I have a four-wheeler. I ride 
often. It? I've been checking cows every day and spraying thistles in the pasture. Anyway, I like to be do some worthwhile every day, then it's a good day. Small meat chunks, square cereal, eggs are good. Try to eat as much protein as I can. I depend a lot on my wife. I've been a nursing home once for her, I think. And it's a big chore in the morning to get dressed. Big chore to eat, getting to me. I've lost quite a bit of weight in the last year. No appetite, you know, hard to eat. Um, otherwise, I'm doing fine. All is well. All is well with my soul. So it is right. Body, mm -hmm. body is weak, but the spirit is gone. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, you know, that kind of a story and making that story is, uh, you have to be a courageous man to put yourself out there, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciated you doing that. Well, let's talk about Parkinson's. I mean, you're, that's a movement disorder. Correct. Why, why is it? Tell me, how would you diagnose Parkinson's disease? So, like we talked about before, it's a clinical diagnosis, and what that means is that it's a diagnosis that the clinician can come up with when you, based on a history and a physical examination. So, um, and I explain this to patients, when I, when those words come out of my mouth and I say, you know, you have Parkinson's disease, usually the first few minutes there's a blank stare, um, but then I try and back up and explain how I made that diagnosis because people are expecting a blood test or an imaging test or something to say, oh yes, this is, you're right. Um, and that's not how we diagnose Parkinson's disease. So what we're really looking for to diagnose are what we call the four cardinal motor features. So these are movement abnormalities that can be picked up on an examination. Like a pill rolling tremor. Correct, so the first thing is a tremor, and the tremor of Parkinson's is typically what we call a rest tremor. So a tremor that's there when you're not using your hands. Not, goes away not, when I move. Yeah, not something that when you pick up the glass it's shaking, although there can be some of that, it's really a tremor at rest when you're not thinking about it. Usually starts on one side of the body, so either an arm or a leg, can affect arms, legs, can affect the jaw, typically not head tremor, so not a, not this a head tremor. tremor. It's a, I can't do the jaw tremor, but a jaw tremor. Um, so we look for a particular tremor. type of tremor. Second thing is um, something called bradykinesia, which is a fancy word for slowness of movement. So this can be seen in lots of different ways. Um, can result in kind of that poker face, so less facial movement, less spontaneous facial movement. Um, there's a tendency not to blink your eyes as frequently, kind of more of a stare. Um, Falling forward when you're trying to walk, and you, your feet can't keep up with your yep, body. Yep, you can get the, the festination where you get the short shuffling strides and you kind of get in the running motion. Um, we see it, um, you know, patients will complain about having trouble buttoning buttons or getting coins out of a purse or more kind of coordination issues. Um, on examination, we do different things to elicit that. Um, so that's a so very- slow to, slow to initiate movement, bradykinesia. Right, bradykinesia. Third thing is something called rigidity, or um, some people refer to it as an inc increase in tone. It's something that we can determine based on an examination on how your, your limbs move um, on an examination. So it's not something that people are going to pick up and say, oh, I have rigidity. Um, they're going to come in complaining of stiffness, primarily. And then the fourth cardinal motor feature is um, postural instability, so difficulty maintaining balance. So um, this can be difficult getting out of a chair. This can be difficulty with losing your balance when you're up, tendency for falls. Tends to occur later in the illness than some of the others I've talked about, but it can occur early. So to diagnose, we have to have the bradykinesia, 
and then one of the others. Okay, so the bradykinesia is the primary one, yep. and then you add one more to the, the story. I know the classic uh, uh, cogwheeling uh, rigidity. Test me for cogwheel rigidity. Okay. So what we do is just relax there. So we just have the patient relax, and we just move your muscles around the joint there. And so we're, we're looking for any resistance to movement. So that's the stiffness. Yep. And when then I have a tremor on top of that, it'll go boop, 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 boop. Yep. So if you got the tremor, it'll kind of be... <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have tremor, because not everybody does, it will just be more of a resistance to movement. So it, it, the perfect... Uh, that type of this cog wheeling doesn't always occur. Doesn't does always occur, and you don't have it. <laughs> and I don't, do I? No. So, 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 Jen, people are are maybe gonna not remember that term bradykinesia very well, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not, you know, it's not right. something you use every day. Um, but what about when pa patients notice, or their families notice, oh, they're talking softer, or their handwriting is Smaller. gotten really yeah, tiny? Right. Yeah. Is that is that part of what you That's would call the? Same the this, it's part of the bradykinesia, yeah. or manifestations of the bradykinesia. So sometimes I hear people come in and they've. Um, observe these things, and, and they're very real. I mean, in fact, you see the patients, right? They're, they're really small. Right. And um, Although it's interesting that, you know, I can just about walk into a room and based on posture and how people and their look, facial I can almost, you know, if they've got a decent amount of Parkinson's, I can tell right off the bat. And oftentimes I'll ask the family, I'll say, have you noticed any change in their speech or their voice or right. how their face moves and nope, nope, and it's totally <laughs> obvious to me, but I think sometimes when you're around it, it's a gradual sure. enough change that, sure. that you don't realize it. So. Sure, right. I remember um, when, I, when I first came out to practice, I had had a fair amount of neurology and I did recognize it early and I would tell the patient they had had possibility of Parkinson's disease, well, we don't have good treatments for it, so it didn't make anything, uh, didn't help them any because we don't have good treatments, it just panicked them. Mm -hmm. They would go off to a, somewhere, I remember a guy went to the Mayo Clinic, the Mayo Clinic says, you don't have Parkinson's disease. He came back to me and I, okay, all right, I was wrong. Two years later, of course, he had the manifestations. Sure. And, and uh, I realized we didn't need to slap the, him, him uh, in the face with that diagnosis. So I've been slower to make that diagnosis, <laughs> even though you know that it's coming. Yeah. And in fact, with, uh, with our, the patient that was just presented here, he asked me, is it Parkinson? I said, you know what? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Let's just keep moving, keep right, moving. Right. The most treatment, I had a doctor friend who had Parkinson's disease and he was a runner. And I swear he did better and lasted longer and functioned longer into this terrible disease by running, mm -hmm. continuing to run. I'm sure, Jen, you, there's a lot of research about exercise. There is a lot of what research. What would you say about that? What would you? It's probably one of the things that I focus most on, especially, you know, and when you, diagnose somebody with an illness that there's no cure for and that you say this is going to get progressively worse they tend to get oh down in the dumps and so i like to i like to end the conversation with you know there's something you can do to help yourself right and that's that is exercise and and staying healthy and i often tell my patients i say you know i wish i could put all of my patients who do the exercise and all of them who don't in the room together and, and let them. them see how <laughs> how the other group is doing because you know regardless of what you tell me when you come in i can almost pick out who's actually doing their exercises really you can there's tell there's such there's such, such a, a difference a difference um, between the two groups and the best exercise would be well you know there's really no bad exercise so lots of studies on different things Boxing, um, Tai Chi, Okay, I want to disagree with that. I don't think boxing is a good idea. <laughs> so, okay, so not boxing a punching bag, not... Oh, okay, good yes, enough, good yes. enough. So, I mean, there, you know, at our, <laughs> at our hospital, we have a boxing program for oh, okay. Parkinson's patients. So they're and boxing a punching, punching bag. Punching bag, yes. Not, okay, not I, thought, I just want to make sure you... Yeah. <laughs> well, because that's the big deal with, you know, Muhammad Ali, right. his story. Um, the, because the, his, the, he had well, Parkinson's sure, disease because he, of well, boxing. Well, I think yeah. they always wondered that. I don't, I don't, I don't, they I don't, I don't know if we'll it, ever know exactly. But, um, but I was just going to put in a plug that um, neurologists are opposed to any sport that where the intent is to hurt the other person person's brain is not well, part of the, <laughs> Let's go to that cause. Uh, um, we really do think that, that uh, Muhammad Ali had it because of uh, what they call pugilistic. Uh, uh, yeah. But, uh, and of course you can't prove it, but the, the question I would have is, uh, do we have, we know where in the brain there are lesions. Where is that? 
So, well, with Parkinson's, it's a um, dopamine deficiency. So it's really the dopaminergic neurons. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's important in brain cells communicating with one another. And it's particularly important for what we call the motor circuit. And so when the dopamine drops, that there's a short circuit basically. And so the abnormal movements occur. I don't know that I'm not aware of any specific parts of the brain or I mean no there's not specific lesions that you would see in terms of an MRI or anything the like MRI that. is normal right the MRI is normal no that's um, where the biomarker story comes into play too like are you gonna be able to get so precise about observing say a, a dopamine deficiency in the brain that you could actually do a scan and pick that up and I mean experimentally these things are being done um, and I suppose at some point there will be a better way of doing that but as a practical matter there is no yeah. so and it's, as far as causes go I don't know about, you know, we do think uh, it might be insecticide or some of, the, of those things, but I would just say right here and now, it's, it's a message, don't traumatize your brain. Absolutely. Head trauma, you know, when you, when you hit your head uh, before, uh, during a game and it, you, it rings your bell, take a break. And I mean, the break may be the next, uh, the next, uh, uh, oh, show uh, sure. the next game, skip it, uh, or we'll make sure that you have a better helmet, that type of a thing. Yeah, I mean, the NFL has certainly raised raised the awareness of um, chronic uh, traumatic brain injury and, and what can happen with that. And so there's a huge level of interest in that. And so now that's another form of dementia. Now we would talked about those chapters in the book, the right, different right, right. types of dementia, that, that um, post-traumatic encephalopathy related to repetitive um, head trauma. And the take-home message? Well, I think, uh, first of all, what, what's happening at the grassroots level is absolute focus on dealing with um, preventing traumatic brain injury in whatever way we can, but also a huge interest in the sports arena, um, starting with kids at young ages, if they're competing in com uh, contact sports that involve the potential for head injury, how can we minimize the risk? Right. I mean, there's a risk there, right? I mean, we know there's a risk. Um, with football and hockey and wrestling and other sports that involve um, that sort of, actually girls playing soccer is another concern. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. and and soccer and girls is the biggest head trauma f and boys football, right? I, I think that's about right for, by the numbers. By the numbers. By the total. Yeah. Uh, and bike injuries, so certainly helmets. I've heard though that if you've had one trauma, you know, if you had one concussion, if your bell was rung one time, you've, the second one is that the big danger. Yeah, Do we know that? Well, there's there's a couple of different angles on that. One is if you're not recovered from that first concussion right. and now you take a second one, it's going to be extra you know, extra harmful, right, probably. Um, the other sort of fear is that what if you um, have that concussion or had a, have a blow to the head, then take another blow and maybe trigger internal bleeding. I mean, there's that sort of emergency scenario that could happen. So we've got like you know, 30 seconds. Any take home message you want to make sure uh, you give to the audience? <laughs> well, I think, you know, and this is my patients will say they hear this every time is staying healthy by exercising will do a lot for you um, in terms of neurologic illness. You're ringing, you're singing <laughs> my song. I love that. That's so important. And the other thing, and I think Jen and I would agree that if, if, if someone's concerned that they're picking up uh, a dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or something uh, that it concerns them is to go get help right away because there are things we can do. I mean, we can, first of all, clarify what's going on, almost certainly clarify what's going on. And, and there's treatment for whatever it is. I mean, even if there, even like you said, even if there's no cure, there are treatments available. And so uh, we encourage people to come in early and be evaluated early. Make sure B12 levels are normal. Make sure thyroid levels yeah. are normal. Those kinds there's of things. There's some laboratory studies. Um, but yeah, we do a thorough assessment and, and look for anything that we can fix. Okay, great. We'll I'll be back in just a minute. All around town, from stores to playgrounds, babies are on the move. And there are diseases that are on the move too. And some of these spread easily. To best protect him from 14 serious diseases by the time he turns two years old, vaccinate him according to the recommended schedule so he can go on about his business and you can have peace of mind. For more reasons to vaccinate, talk to your child's doctor or go to cdc.gov forward slash vaccines. Fifty years ago in the highlands of New Guinea, a strange neurodegenerative epidemic occurred among one tribe 
This native society was being devastated by a condition they call kuru, which in their language means shivers or shakes. People affected with kuru would start with an unsteady gait, tremors, and slurred speech. Although dementia was minimal, kuru would cause mood changes and then progress to an inability to stand or eat. The victims of this disease would then die in a coma about 12 months after gait changes started. As medical science analyzed this condition, it was discovered that kuru was caused by an infectious virus-like prion, a misfolded protein, which causes other protein molecules to become misshapen, clump, and accumulate in the brain. Kuru characteristically concentrates in the cerebellum, which is the balance and coordination center of the brain. The macabre turn to this story came when scientists discovered kuru was spread as a result of the rather gruesome practice of ritualistic cannibalism among this remote tribe. Recently deceased beloved relatives would be prepared and consumed, especially the brains, in a ceremony to honor the dead. Thus, infection would spread. Kuru, like several other brain prion diseases, causes neurologic symptoms months to even decades after transmission of the infection, making the diagnosis difficult. Other examples of this kind of brain infection include Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in humans, mad cow disease in cattle, scrapie in sheep, and chronic wasting disease in deer and elk. Although this kind of protein-changing infection cannot be transmitted through the air or by casual contact, it can be transmitted by consumption of infected tissue or bodily fluids. One should not jump to conclusion that other neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's are due to a prion infection like Kuru. However, there are protein changes and clumping noted in these brains too, giving one pause to consider that there could be some sort of infectious relationship to these neurologic conditions as well. Research goes on. With a great deal of effort and local government intervention, the people of that tribe in New Guinea were convinced to no longer consume their recently dead relatives, and Kuru has mostly disappeared. Ritualistic cannibalism is gone, but other prion infections of the brain are not. It is through careful scientific research and work that we have hope. So there are resources uh, that, that would benefit people if they were interested in finding more about these conditions. Jen? Sure, we enlisted some um, websites that um, we've looked into. Um, I, you know, you'll see there's the Michael J. Fox website. There's tons of information on there, both for caregivers and patients regarding Parkinson's disease, um, clinical trials that they can get involved in. They can even sign up for what's called the Fox Trial Finder. Oh, wow. It will get them plugged in for potential research studies. Um, there's also um, a website called the Davis Finney Foundation. Um, again, lots of good information with a focus on exercise. So there's a exercise video that can be downloaded off of that wow. website um, and can be used as a guide, especially for those patients in rural South Dakota that don't have access to physical therapy. Okay. Um, and then just some other general information websites out there. Um, and we have a link to the Alzheimer's Association okay. and um, the South Dakota Alzheimer's okay. um, Foundation. And you can go to prairiedoc.org for these sources too. Well, a big thank you to our guests, Dr. Jennifer Kruger and Dr. Matthew Simmons for helping us with tonight's show. Thank you very much. That does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people.
major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota State Medical Association. Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision. Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Black Hills Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care, Sanford Clinic, Community Service Committee, Regional Health, and Swiftel Communications. And Lynn Productions, 